celebrating our beloved instrument, its history, tradition, and our companion for life. It has been for me, and it will be, I'm sure, for all of you as you go on. I would love to just give a tribute also. Uh, I'm probably new to all of you, but just where I came from, as Americans are, they always have come from somewhere else. And I was very lucky to have ancestors who came on my father's side from the very top of what was called the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a little town full of musicians, 10 miles south of Krakow, Poland. And I had a grandfather who was a very good violinist and had a family full of musicians and cousins who were also in that town. And they decided they would form a family orchestra. And when uh, there was a world exposition in the United States in about 1889 in Chicago, Illinois, they had the inspiration that maybe they would emigrate, but first they would play a concert in that World's Fair. So they came to Chicago, thank heaven, and uh, the shine side of the family stayed in Chicago, and the other, the Amsterdam family, went to Los Angeles, where they became very prominent musicians in orchestras and freelance, and my family stayed in Chicago, and my father was born, uh, his son out of eight children in Chicago. So that's my family background and my luck to have uh, a mother who was a violinist who had gone to the Chicago Musical College, met my father, who, whose own violinist father had said to his eight children, none of you is going to be a musician, it's too difficult. <laughs> you have to realize there's such a thing, at that time there was not, of a musician's union. It was formed very much in Chicago at that time, by people who felt that musicians needed more security. And my father, a lawyer, was involved with his brother, also a lawyer, um, in the formation of that protection for the life of musicians. But uh, it skipped a generation. And uh, it was wartime, and in this country, and I think probably in many at that time, the Second World War, radios were on 24 hours a day. And we just had the news and the music and it never stopped. I'm sure that was most families in this country. And our big radio, at that time they were big and loud, was in our dining room in Chicago, in Evanston, where we lived. I was hearing that music, the, mil the patriotic songs and military songs every day of my life. And that's how I ran to the piano when I was three, and I reproduced one of those songs. And luckily, my parents thought it was pretty interesting, and that perhaps I should go to a really good teacher and see if this talent was the real thing. So that's how I started. And the choice of the teachers was incredible in my case, and I'm sure in yours. You've come from your own teachers, our faculty have come from teachers, so very much of my tribute today is to my own teachers and my parents' choice of those people. So at four, I was accepted by a very distinguished couple, Dr. Glenn Dillard Gunn and his wife, who were both piano teachers and had been to Europe to study, uh, graduate study, I guess you would call it. They were American born with uh, Ferruccio Bozzoni and uh, Arthur Friedheim, who was one of the great pianists from the Liszt uh, era, his secretary, one of the great pianists in his class in, in Weimar. And they had studied, uh, advanced study with those two. So I suddenly had that legacy. Of course, I didn't understand it from four to 13, just what that meant, but of course we all do those names. And at 13, I was accepted at Peabody Conservatory by Mieczysław Muntz, one of the great uh, golden virtuosos of the 20th century, from born in Krakow, Poland. 
stopped here on a concert tour in 1939, very successful beginning of a career, and was stopped uh, as Poland was invaded by the Nazis. And he lost 23 members of his family, including parents and his family. He never returned. But that was our great fortune, because those that he taught, he also performed, but uh, he had a very troubled life being left in this country all alone. And he was convinced by others that he must now teach. And he had been doing that, but as a kind of star virtuoso in Curtis and uh, Cincinnati, and he had started a great life. But luckily, he came to Peabody. He was commuting from New York, and he was pretty much asleep. He was a kind of an emotional, uh, I would say wreck almost, but he was put uh, in better shape by the director than Reginald Stewart, with whom he had played. Reginald Stewart was from Scotland, but he had been in Toronto as a conductor. And Muntz had played over 20 times a concerto with him. He was then director of Peabody. And that was a fortunate thing for Mieczysław Muntz because he knew that this man must be rehabilitated emotionally. And why doesn't he come and teach there? Now that was a few years before my mother brought me to audition for him. So that again is great fortune in my life. Now, he said after about a week um, to my parents, I think if you would give me three to five years, I think she's going to have a long life in music, and I have a plan of how to train her for a long life as a pianist. Now, I confess to you that I'm sort of proud of the fact, most people hide it, that I am 82 years old. And you'll see whether I can still play. But if I can, it's because of what he did. Now, I didn't know what he was going to do, but uh, he did. He had a plan because that's how the old artists and pianists were trained. I call it what was coming was an Olympic kind of training, like athletes do for the Olympics. My goodness, he said, I take my vacations in Mexico City to my parents. Would you bring her? Because I would like to give her a lesson every day. I thought, oh, that sounds wonderful, absolutely beautiful. We drove to Mexico City and uh, had a place rented to live. What I didn't know is that his plan was to come every morning at 9 o'clock and stay through dinner to evening. I had at least six hours of learning how to practice new repertoire, but the fact was that when he rang the doorbell every single morning of those three months, I really had never had anything like that. And frankly, I hated it. <laughs> I didn't hate him, but I thought, is this going to happen every morning? And this thing on the piano, I would bite it when he left. <laughs> is he going to come back the next morning? Well, bless his heart, he did. Now, that was several summers he did that. And I had. 18 of the Chopin etudes. I had the Wanderer fantasy of Schumann. I had everything he could give me, Rachmaninoff, um, uh, Debussy, Ravel, really difficult stuff. But he taught me how to work on it. And of course, again, I didn't really love all of that because I had no escape. He was standing there while I did that to be sure I did it. And then my mother in the kitchen, you know, she was supporting him, not me. So there was no escape, thank the good Lord. Um, he did that for several summers. Now I don't need to go on with my story because this is about you here. My first teacher, Mrs. Gunn, gave me my first Chopin etude and I would like to play that for you. Um, posthumous, they call it, post uh, you know, after death, dedicated to the great Ignaz Moscheles, that you can find out by reading about him. Uh, all the artists and pianists of the day and musicians revered this extraordinary man, friend of Mendelssohn. Uh, anyway, these three 
one of whom, the A flat major, was my first Chopin from my first teacher. And I still love it and play it as an encore today, so I start with that. Remember the key of A flat major because uh, I want to expand on that. Has anyone played this, this etude? Because I hope you really like it and do learn it. I think my teacher gave it to me for one, one or two reasons. One, it's rhythmically two against three, so she was teaching me something with that. And then pedaling. Bazzoni was a giant of a pianist and musician and very famous for his innovative pedaling. And we heard that pianists would come to his concerts and do this. They were watching what he did magically with the pedal. So the guns and monks were very conscious of that. So maybe you can listen for that too in this very short and beautiful etude. Say play, 
and they were surrounding you so that you could touch them. I didn't know who they were. It was terrifying. <laughs> but this was experience, and it was great experience to do that every week with his class. So he was serious about the future. So anyway, um, I have to say that he started with major Chopin, both sonatas. Uh, the first one he gave me was B flat minor, which is interesting. I was very scared of that piece. And um, F minor concerto, which is uh, a key. He didn't give me the E minor at all, but the F minor, um, I finished the etudes, all the preludes, uh, mazurkas, nocturnes, impromptus, uh, as I say, both sonatas. Uh, it was a huge thing, and that was included in the lessons and the daily things in Mexico. Then one day he said, I think it's time we make a recital. Uh, and that happened at the Phillips Gallery in Washington, and I was 15. He planned the program, Mozart Sonata, F major, Schumann Humorist. He was, by the way, the great first teacher I had who was in love with Schumann. The artists of the day were in love with Schumann. Major uh, thing, uh, pieces on programs, major identification with these great artists. Um, the arabesque was, the opening was a theme song on a radio program for great pianists that we heard every week. I mean, you, some of you have anybody, has anybody played the Schumann Arabesque? No. Well, I hope, I hope this makes you love it. <laughs> but this is a theme song. <laughs>
did in a lot of pieces, because he just had a horrible time there, waiting, ironically, for her father, who was eventually his piano teacher, Frederick Wieck, who was not a very nice man. And he uh, was very upset with this growing liaison, as you know. And when Schumann finally decided that he wanted to be a really great pianist, he was not very young. He was good at it, but the best teacher was Clara's father. And he was very demanding, but more than that, and dangerously, he saw in Schumann something that he could make into the greatest pianist in the world. Now that's in some of these books. And I haven't found that in every book, but I find it very revealing uh, because it gives one, two, three, four, five of this extraordinary demand of work and discipline and practice. I mean, it would scare anybody to death. But here he had the daughter. I doubt if he ever did that with this absolutely born from God pianist that Clara was. And I think often that that was a very difficult thing for Schumann who wanted to be like her, but God didn't make him like that. So of course we know he worked too hard, he tried too hard, and the father and you know, uh, Clara was pushing him, and of course it wrecked his fingers. So don't do that. <laughs> Uh, as much ambition as we have, but the beautiful thing is that his life evolved and they did marry and everything came out okay, as we know, for a while for them. Uh, the next thing that I would like to do, now you've heard A flat major and C major. Um, those two keys, as I've been preparing this over a pretty long time, have become very special moments in these pieces for the most emotional confessions. Now, the end of the arabesque was a C major confession. Um, I'm going to Schumann again for the A flat major. Now, we know the concerto, which was in a happy time with Clara for him. <laughs> to the distant beloved. But as I said, all of the piano pieces that we know of Schumann were in a state of waiting for her. Meanwhile, I was sent this beautiful um, description of the song itself. Schumann not only put it into the fantasy, he put it into one of his string quartets, one of his symphonies, and in one part of the great song cycle, Frauen lieben und leben, women's life and loves, which is one of the most beautiful things ever written by anybody. Perhaps Schubert, another, but that's wonderful. So uh, a friend who is a vocal accompanist sent me the actual words of the Beethoven song. 
that was the original for this. I had never read these words, but I thought I would like to share them because they're so special. It has so much in this uh, section here that was a poet in Beethoven's time, and he used it. So he will send her the songs he has written, and she will sing them to the lute. When the red of sunset falls across the blue sea and behind the distant mountain, she will sing what he has sung artlessly from the fullness of his heart, out of his longing, and these songs will vanquish what keeps them so far apart and will join one loving heart to the other. No wonder Schumann was obsessed. And that's together with Beethoven's inspiration at the same time. Um, so, what is this tune that was so obsessive for him? Um, I haven't played the fantasy, so I beg your uh, patience with me. But I want to, he's put in a lot of times, as, she, as those of you who have played the fantasy, um, in the last movement, which, by key, is in C major. So he must have chosen that. When we heard the 111 the other day end in C major, wow, that was something. Also, we heard the franc. That ended in C major. And then so does the fantasy end in C major. Must have been something special in that key. So um, I'm going to just play Up in the Sky, which makes it so beautiful. Um, um. Uh, 
um, opera, and he went crazy for that. So he was kind of obsessed in a beautiful way with this composer. So I just love to share this little portrait. <laughs> from a dream world far away, 
a soft lulling rhythm in the background. At first, our hero seems to be in peaceful slumber, but his dreams gradually become increasingly troubled. This is a piece where a motive is close to the beginning, as you know, very troubled.
major. Incredible. <laughs> the nocturne, maybe you have all have played C minor. Nocturne has a way also of morphing into C major. This was something Mrs. Gunn gave me very early, and I have a very funny story about that. I was 10, and she had given me this rather large C minor nocturne. She never said to me that anything was difficult. And people would ask her, how in the world did you give that little thing such a piece? She says, well, if it's easy, I never tell her it's difficult. <laughs> That's a true story. So I was 10, and my father decided he would do some special things for his 10-year-old. So he uh, took the whole family to New York City. We lived in Washington, so we went to New York. We stayed at the Plaza Hotel. This was how some parents can really spoil you. I just thought it was normal. <laughs> we stayed at the biggest, most beautiful hotel. He bought tickets for a special theater and the old Metropolitan Opera. Don Carlos, he chose. I mean, that's about hours long. But he wanted us to see this old opera house. He got a box, everything in gold and velvet and extraordinary. But for a 10-year-old, you know, it was kind of big and interesting. And then uh, it was Josi Björling, the great, great uh, singer from Sweden, who was the lead. Uh, I didn't know that name at all. It didn't mean a thing to me. And I sat in the box, and after about an hour, I fell asleep. <laughs> but um, this was one thing he decided we, we should enjoy and be exposed to on my birthday. Second thing was South Pacific, which was just starting at that time. And it had Ezio Pinza, another great singer, in a major park in there. But that I really enjoyed. I didn't fall asleep at all. And then the next night, we went to something called Peter Pan, the story of Peter Pan. Another great artist, Mary Martin, was in that, as she was in South Pacific. Uh, this was just a galaxy of exciting things in the city. However, there was something that I was very nervous about. My father had known a, a producer on the radio and with a very well-known conductor uh, who had conducted the first Rhapsody in Blue of George Gershwin. Uh, he had a radio program and I was booked on that program to play this nocturne. And um, I thought, okay, I'm nervous, but uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll do it because my teacher said I should do it, I should do this piece. So uh, in the rehearsal just before the broadcast, which was live, um, I started it out. He wanted to hear uh, how it began. As you know, this is pretty serious stuff. So I did play that uh, on that program. That was my first time when I was 10. And uh, today I will have trouble with it, with how this expands. But it has very soon after that
of one of the etudes that I've now played since that first recital, where there were 12 of them in Phillips Gallery when I was 15, chosen from different opuses. So the program was the Mozart, the Schumann Humoress, Intermission, and 12 etudes. That was my first time playing the very last one, but it's not the last time I played it. And I just will share with you in, in conclusion that uh, two years ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, scheduled, and I did it, uh, the night before New York shut down, actually, um, a tribute to a Chopin series that I had done 40 years earlier at Alice Tully Hall, a series that uh, concert a month during a whole season. It took me years to prepare for that, and somebody uh, who sponsored it and who wanted that again in New York, a whole Chopin series. It had been over 30 years since one had been given. So my first reaction when she said, I would like you to do it, is why me? And I really meant, why me? Why should I do this? Well, it took me two years to have an answer, and that she finally, finally said to me, she was a tough lady in, in a wonderful way, she says, look, you have to go in a room and you have to ask yourself, do you want to do this or do you not? And then you come out of the room and you tell me, yes or no. <laughs> so I took a, a long time, got some special advice, and I suddenly realized that I had had two Polish mentors. I had had Mieczysław Muntz, and by a miracle, as I say, and I won't, I won't tell you the whole story, but I was, um, Come to the, I came to the attention of Arthur Rubenstein through my recording of the third Rachmaninoff, given to him by a, a very, almost a relative of his. And at first he had no interest in another prodigy. He didn't want to hear anything. But she tried a second time. And that time it was in a party he had in 1961. And he started to listen. He listened to the whole thing with the whole party people who were there. And he sort of summoned me to come to New York and meet him. And uh, the drama of it was that he wanted to know with whom I studied and to bring him as well as my family. So that's how that started in 1961. But um, he helped me with the series. He got a piano in his hotel and he spent weeks coaching me on this. He wanted me to do it. He was very, very into uh, making this the best experience that I've had. So this etude to me, two years ago, the pandemic um, hadn't begun. The next day, the city shut down. And I played an all Chopin program in uh, memory of the series in 19, uh, the series was, um, uh, I'm trying to think, in 1980 and 81, went through that year. So this was 40 years. This was in Wild Hall in Carnegie. And for some miracle, there was a good audience there, and I was so grateful. Uh, I knew it was a sacrifice for so many people to come out at that time, although New York was still alive that night. So I decided that after the program, I would play this uh, etude as an encore. Um, it, it is uh, so powerful, and it says so much, Again, it ends in C major. So that's the end of today's sharing with you, is this etude. And perhaps it will become my favorite encore as I get older. Um, Rubenstein, his last recital in New York, which my husband and I were very, very uh, moved to attend, had two Schumann works on it. I just want you to know that. Um, Carnival, before intermission, Beethoven Sonata, Carnival, intermission, Fantasy Stück. Now, how does Fantasy Stück end? It says the end of the story. So, at the end of his long and unparalleled career, he wanted to say something with that composer. So, anyway, here is the last etude, and thank you for all your listening and sharing, which I have loved every minute. Thank you.